All right, so we are at that time. Uh, today we have Bryony DuPont visiting us from Oregon State University. Uh, she comes previously from Carnegie Mellon, where she got her PhD in mechanical engineering. Uh, and now she's been an assistant professor at Oregon State for five years. This is my fifth year, yeah. Fifth year, good. And she's gonna be talking to us about her work in design automation. So thank you all for your attention. And with that, I'll turn it over to Brian. Great, thank you. Hi, everybody. How are you? <laughs> good, good, glad to hear it. Uh, as David said, or Dr. Burke said, sorry. Uh, I'm Brian e. DuPont. I'm an assistant professor of mechanical engineering at Oregon State University. And today I want to talk to you about a subset of mechanical design called design automation. Uh, we're effectively trying to replace all of you with robots that are going to be a lot more efficient. I'm kidding. Uh, my specific focus is using design automation to kind of advance green causes. So we do a lot of work in renewable energy systems. We do a lot of work in sustainability and product design. My lab's kind of split down the middle. Uh, so we'll be talking about that today. All right, so first, a little bit about me. I'm kind of weird. Uh, I'm from a very small town in northern Maine called Caribou. You know it's a good sign when your town is named after a large game. <laughs> it's bad signs. Uh, this is actually a much more apt picture of Caribou. Caribou is known for its very low temperatures and lots of snow, so it feels like being home, kind of visiting all of you. Uh, I moved from there to Cleveland, Ohio to get my bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from a school there called Case Western Reserve University. Uh, so I completed my BS in mechanical engineering. I have two minors, one's in material science and one is in theater. This is from a production I was in in college of Footloose. Uh, the theater degree is surprisingly useful. Maybe we'll have time to talk about that. Uh, then I moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to get my master's and my PhD, both of which are in mechanical engineering. Uh, while I was there, uh, I was an ASME graduate teaching fellow, so I got to teach a couple classes while I was there. Uh, and I also did some research in Boulder at the National Wind Technology Center, which is a national renewable energy lab. This is me standing on top of a wind turbine in front of a wind turbine. It's very meta. Uh, and as Dr. Burke said, I am now an assistant professor in mechanical engineering uh, out on the West Coast in Corvallis, Oregon, uh, at Oregon State University. My position there has been really exciting. I teach in a large mechanical design group. So I cover classes in introducing students to mechanical design. I talk about sustainability and product design. I just introduced a design for manufacturing class, which is an awful lot of fun. Um, some of the things that I'm obsessed with is graduate student mentoring. So I run workshops for the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. I actually help run student activities for the entire global ASME enterprise, which is a good time. So we talk about what makes good graduate students, how to be a better researcher, how to be a better communicator, things like that. Um, I also still do musicals. I most recently appeared as Ursula in The Little Mermaid, uh, which was great fun. I also have twin girl cats that are the loves of my life. So that's me. Uh, this is my team from left, right, Annalise, Chris, Katie, Donovan, Ada, Vinny, Melissa, Audrey, and Anna. Our work is kind of at this intersection between artificial intelligence, the application of artificial intelligence, so that's design automation, and anything great. So sustainable design, renewable energy, things like that. So this is our mission statement. We want to facilitate designers' ability to create a future state of products and systems with the consideration of environmental sustainability. We want to encourage the consideration of environmental impact as a fundamental tenet of engineering design through the establishment and new design processes, computational methods, and curricular advances. So here's kind of the lay of the land, what I'm gonna be talking about today. First, I wanna motivate why even learning about sustainability matters. I'm talking specifically about an area in design called DFE, Design for the Environment. I'm gonna talk about some of the foundational research that underpins everything we do in the lab, that's specifically design automation, systems optimization, machine learning, and machine intelligence. And then I'm gonna talk kind of about our two application areas. One is product sustainability, some of the work that we've done there. Um, yes, we actually have a study called People Use Things. I'll talk to you about that. Uh, and then renewable energy systems. We have a specific focus in Oregon on offshore energy. You can make electricity from waves, which is kind of cool. Um, so I'll be talking a lot about that work, some offshore and onshore wind work, uh, and then what is next for us. All right, so I'm going to start with a thought experiment. It is 10, 16 in the morning. How many products have you come into contact with already today?
57. 57, nice. One <laughs> just that was it. No eggs, just the kitchen. Right, got it. Uh, so the answer is thousands. Seriously. So I woke up in a hotel room this morning, so I am immediately in contact with sheets, mattress, pillow, pillowcase, that weird thing that they always put at the end of hotel room beds, which serves no purpose. Um, you know, the carpeting on the floor, all of the furniture in the room, the shampoo bottles that I dragged with me and thankfully didn't leak this time, the towels, which of course for hotels are washed every day, even if you don't use them, uh, toothbrushes, all of the makeup that I have on right now, the clothes that I have on, jewelry I have on, the tea that I drank this morning uh, in a disposable cup, awful of my computer, which I'm literally in contact with right now, my phone. Devin, who picked me up, we we walked over here, but we could have just as easily taken a, a van, not to mention all of the stuff that I carry around with me in my book bag. So just today, I have come into contact already with a thousand products easily, and I'm jet lagged, so you guys have it worse than I do. Uh, the thing to remember is that even though this is an, an atrocious and impractical number of products that you come in contact with already today, the kicker is there are hundreds of millions of people who have done this exact same thing. They are consuming the exact same products that you are, throwing away the same empty shampoo bottles, buying the same disposable cups of coffee uh, that you're carting around. And this type of product use and consumption is fundamentally unsustainable. Sorry, we can't keep using products this way. Uh, so why does this matter? So I'm just going to throw facts at you for a second. Humans have consumed more resources in the last 50 years than they have in all previous history. We are literally running out of resources here. Uh, household consumption, so that includes products, foods, appliances, constitutes 70% of the greenhouse gas emissions in industrialized countries, just in case you were thinking it was cars. It's not. It's you living your life. Uh, global population growth and increased affluence will create further and untenable surges in the demand for consumer products. So things like electronic goods are getting more efficient. Your washing machine uses way less electricity than it used to, way less water than it used to, too. Um, problem is now 10 people have a washing machine for the one who used to have it 20 years ago. Uh, but this also has ramifications on the industrial, on the industrial side. 93% of CEOs believe sustainability to be central to the future success of their companies, but the majority cite the complexity of implementing sustainable design in practice as a significant barrier. You know what this tells me? If you come out of undergrad or grad school with an understanding of sustainability and design, you are hireable because they care about this stuff. They just don't know how to do it. They're expecting the, the newest engineers to be able to know how to do it. A 2009 survey from ASME revealed that 40% of respondents are extremely interested in green and sustainable causes. Uh, and lastly, 55% of consumers state that they are willing to pay more for products from companies that are committed to reducing environmental impact. And whether that's revealed through packaging or brand identity or whatever else, people are actually saying, yeah, it's okay, I'll pay an extra couple of bucks for that recyclable water bottle. So a lot of what I'm talking about today has to do with a product's life cycle. So I just want to clarify that just in case this terminology is new to you. It's this idea that you can trace the life of a consumer product from the extraction of its raw materials, which is up at the top there. Um, we're literally digging up ore out of the ground. We're using petroleum and plastics. You process those materials into, uh, sorry, you process those raw materials into usable materials. Then you manufacture your parts, you assemble them. Uh, then you've got a user who's using the product for an, undetermined period of time. Uh, and then usually that person throws it away when they're done. Very few people actually find ways, go out of their way to recycle things when they're done with them. Uh, the reason why I'm particularly interested in studying sustainability is that there needs to be more people in engineering who are studying sustainability. It is the designer and only the designer that has overview of the entire design and manufacturing process. So even though I claim to be a mechanical designer, I'm actually interested in this whole thing. We do a lot of studies about where the materials come from, how you can recycle them, uh, how people use them especially. Um, if you're designing a product, you can bake in information throughout this entire life cycle based on your decisions that you make up front. All right, so I wanted to talk briefly about what design automation is. Design automation is applied artificial intelligence. 
it's kind of a subset of AI. It's what you can apply to actual products and systems. So it's kind of the more engineering side of AI as opposed to the computer science side of AI. Um, things like optimization, things like um, design for failure reduction, machine intelligence, um, all of these things kind of complex system design fall under automation. We specifically focus on computational uh, automation methods. So optimization, data-driven design, complex systems design, uh, multi-objective optimization. Those are kind of our primary uh, areas of interest. You guys know what optimization is? You covered that, maybe numerical methods class or something like that? No, okay, <laughs> that's fine. Optimization is the, the mathematical science of making things better. So in product design, I can optimize the shape of this bottle so that it is less likely to leak. My objective is that I don't want it to leak. I will optimize the shape or maybe the threads or whatever so that it doesn't do so. Make sense? If you can assign math to it, you can optimize it. So some of the, uh, the design automation methods that we use kind of historically happened later on in a product's design cycle. So this is kind of the classic product design process. You start with product discovery saying, this is the thing that I'm gonna make. Uh, project planning is just kind of planning when you're going to have deliverables, when you're going to be able to um, you know, create CAD models and kind of move things down the line. Product definition and conceptual design kind of happen together. You're defining what your customer needs, your engineering specs, you uh, actually sit down and sketch, y'all sketchers. All right, okay, you make CAD models. And the product development is where you actually manufacture the thing. Uh, and then later you have pro product support. So typically, kind of in the middle of this design phase, this is these are all of the design decisions that you're making. You're making choices about the form, which is the shape, the function of the product, materials, things like price, um, where you're actually gonna be producing it, how it's gonna be supported, cost, things like that. That's all developed kind of at this point in the, uh, the cycle. But it's later down the line that we're actually generating data about a product. So if I make 100,000 of this particular water bottle, um, I can't figure out how people are interacting with it. I can't figure out whether or not people are throwing them away or how they're breaking, usually until much later on, kind of in the support phase. So one of the things that I'm really interested in doing is learning from this data, taking this data and moving it earlier on in the design phase. So sure, right now, if I've got 100,000 of these in the field, I can interview my users, I can garner feedback in other ways. Uh, to try to say, yeah, next time I design this water bottle, I'm going to do something slightly different to try to meet those needs. Um, but what if next time I'm not designing a water bottle? What if I'm designing a travel mug? What if I'm designing a laptop? What if I'm designing something completely different? Can we still use that data? Can we find correlations in that data that are going to be helpful for us? So our primary application areas for design automation methods are in product sustainability uh, and renewable energy systems. I'm gonna start by talking through uh, product sustainability. These are uh, four of the projects that we've got going on right now. The first is called the Green Quiz, which is an online tool that helps you design things, uh, well, consumer products specifically, to have a reduced environmental impact. We have a large sustainable design repository. So all of these consumer products, I think there's 67 of them now. Component by component, we have CAD models, we have a bill of materials, we have three different environmental impact analyses for each one all sorts of information, it's all publicly hosted. Um, we've done some work on eco-labeling. Have you ever seen a, an environmentally friendly claim on packaging or something like that? Um, eco-labels are overwhelmingly right. They imply something. It's just usually not quite to the extent that people say it is. Um, you know, they might say, if you buy this, I'm thinking seventh generation, they make like cleaning products, you ever seen that? Yeah. So, you buy these paper towels, then you're reducing the use of trees by 20% or something like that, which is great, except it's not quite 20%, it's more like 6%. Uh, and then one of the big kickers in this work is people use things differently, and it's really hard to measure. Uh, and the use phase of a product's life cycle can have a huge environmental impact. I mean, think about, let me think of a good example. Think about your phone. Y'all love your phones, right? Mine's like, mine's in Dr. Berg's office. I'm a little bit nervous about that. Um, your phone is not a lot of materials. The manufacturing is relatively inexpensive. Uh, they're made very, very quickly. Um, 
aside from the transportation costs to get them here from Asia where they're, where they're manufactured and assembled, the overwhelming majority of the environmental impact of your phone is what? It's due to what? You're charging the thing, exactly. You're using a ton of electricity. You go home at night, you plug it in, right? Um, so if you have that phone for a year, then maybe you're not using all that much electricity. You're using that phone for five years, six years, and then you throw the thing away. Um, that could be the, easily the biggest part of the environmental impact of that product. Uh, and then the second thing I'm gonna talk about is our renewable energy systems work. Um, we've done systems optimization for wave energy converters, onshore wind farms, offshore wind farms, collaborative energy systems, so multiple renewable energy technologies working together. Uh, so I'll talk about those next. So I'll clue you in when we're jumping ship from the product sustainability work and getting into the renewable energy work. Okay, so if I asked you, to design me a more environmentally sustainable product, it is really likely that you're gonna converge on a process that's kind of like this, which is you're gonna find an existing analogous product. She wants a travel mug, I'm gonna go find a travel mug, okay? And then you're gonna analyze it. You're gonna figure out what it's made of, you're gonna figure out how it's made, you're gonna figure out how people use it. Then you're gonna do something called a life cycle assessment. Have any of you heard of a life cycle assessment in LCA? Cool. Um, great, I get to introduce you to this too. So life cycle assessments are um, these quantitative analyses that tell you, based on parameters of the, of the component, what the environmental impact of the component is. It's based on materials, manufacturing, form, it's based on geometry, uh, it's based on where it's made and where it's used, how it's disposed of, uh, all of that. But it's an actual number. They give you numbers at the end, CO2 emissions, water toxicity measures, things like that. We would do an LCA of our theoretical travel mug, making all of these assumptions, uh, and then you would pick and choose what to fix. So in our travel mug here, maybe this kind of neoprene shell has a high environmental impact, you can't really dispose of it well, it's not really recyclable. So maybe you'd say, well, next time, when I redesign this for you, I'm gonna make that out of something that's easy to recycle, and then that's gonna dry down the environmental impact. This is easy, you can do this. I bet if I asked you to do this, you would converge on this idea anyway. The problem is when you're trying to design something that doesn't exist yet, if you don't have some existing analogous product to learn from. So the design of new sustainable products is not so easy. So this is kind of what we've been relying on to do that. We've got a list of sustainable design guidelines, which is great, came out maybe eight or nine years ago. It's a list of considerations that you should make when designing something more sustainably. Can you make this out of 100% recyclable materials? Can you make this so that it's rechargeable and doesn't use disposable batteries, things like that? Uh, you can rely on designer experience know-how. I was a, a product designer for two years before I went to graduate school, and that's what we did. We had the company approach us to try to make a more environmentally friendly hiking book bag, like a hiking pack, uh, and we were just using our own intuition. We were using some of the information that was available to us having been designers for years, which is not great. Um, other things you can do is design analogy. In case studies, you often hear of uh, people using biomimetic design. They're trying to mimic natural processes or systems to try to make them more efficient and therefore more environmentally friendly. Uh, but in general, we don't have a good way to do this. We don't have a good way of, of baking in environmental sustainability into new products. Uh, and this is a huge problem. You're gonna have to spare me for a minute. I have this kind of complicated plot. So on the x-axis, we go from undefined design to the fully defined design. So this is kind of the, the product design process from I've just decided what it is I'm gonna make to I'm gonna toss this over the wall to my manufacturers. Uh, and on the y-axis, it's kind of the depth of the design method that we can use. So uh, down here, we've got simple and quick, something maybe manual, something maybe not quantitative, but more qualitative, versus really in depth. I'm going to get a number that tells me the environmental impact. Uh, life cycle assessment is kind of in this upper right quadrant. You can't really use life cycle assessment until you've defined a lot about your the product that you're designing. You have to know what the materials are. You have to know what manufacturing processes you need to make your components. You have to know where it's going to be made, all sorts of other things. So LCA exists there. LCA is great. It gives you a lot of good information, but you can't apply it until later on. Uh, the sustainable design guidelines that list we were talking about, you can start to use those early on as a way to kind of define your uh, your design decisions as you go. There are a couple other methods that I've filled in here in bubbles. These are kind of variations of LCA. 
Uh, environmentally conscious QFD is environmentally conscious quality function deployment. QFD is a design tool, helps you clarify customer requirements, engineering specs as you're designing something. Um, this effectively just says, my customers want something more environmentally friendly, so I'm gonna integrate it up front. Eco Indicator 99 is an LCA tool that's manual. It's very easy to use. You can look it up right now um, and use it on whatever product you've got laying around. Versus things like SolidWorks Sustainability. Do y'all learn SolidWorks? Sure, so there's a, if you use a sustainability add-on, it's a good time, you should mess around with it. So if you have a component open in SolidWorks, it's just the sustainability tool. Um, and you just find the material and the manufacturing location and a couple other things, then it'll tell you a couple environmental impact indicators, which is great, but you need a CAD model first. So you can't really use that early on. But you can see there is nothing up in this upper left-hand corner. There's nothing that helps you kind of understand the in-depth environmental impact of something as you are designing it. And this is a big problem because 80% of the environmental damage of a product is established after only 20% of the design activity is complete. You bake in that environmental sustainability uh, very early on in the design process, yet we have no tools to help us get there. So that's what really drives uh, a lot of the work that we've been doing in my lab. I talked about these quickly before. We have the web-based sustainable design decision engine as the green quiz. Uh, we have this large sustainable design repository. We're trying to create a data set from which to learn information that we can move kind of earlier on in the design. Uh, we do some machine learning work. We've done a lot of work with understanding uncertainty in LCA um, and then focusing on use in LCA. So I'm gonna step through a bunch of these pretty quickly. So the green quiz is this online decision engine. Uh, I actually think it's live right now because we did a test with it yesterday with a bunch of my students. So if you are bored, I'll give you the, the URL. But we combine all of this information. So the sustainable design guidelines we were talking about, information about international standards. There's quite a few international standards, especially in Europe, uh, on manufacturing products that have reduced environmental impact. Very few here, but a lot there. Uh, design heuristics, kind of that experiential knowledge, uh, customer preference and cost. All this information is embedded uh, we kind of collected and combined it, rephrased it, and came up with some potential responses, and we organized all of these questions as a search tree. And we embedded that search tree into this web-based app. So it's kind of a survey. You answer questions about your product. Um, so we asked some preliminary information. There's some filtering questions that asks, like, does your product, is your product powered? Um, things that will give it different parts of that tree. Um, there's a weighting system that we've embedded in there, so it'll tell you kind of which impacts matter more. So at the end of the quiz, it might say, hey, this would have a reduced environmental impact if you made it out of coated steel instead of stainless steel. Um, but also have a reduced environmental impact if you get rid of the battery. But it, now it tells you which one is which one of those decisions is the one you should make first. Um, so this is kind of an example of one of the trees. Does the product produce waste? Yes. And it asks you these questions and you kind of respond um, based on the questions that, that it gives you. So we've done a couple of studies using this green quiz, um, and including one yesterday, which I don't have the results for yet, but I wish I, wish I did. I want, kind of want to know the difference. So we asked our students, our juniors, to redesign us a toaster to be more environmentally friendly. We had to pre-populate pictures of toasters because we weren't sure if everybody knew exactly what we were talking about when we were talking about toasters. Um, and we had three groups. We had a control group that got nothing. We had a group that was given these sustainable design guidelines and a group that was using the green quiz. Uh, you can see the green quiz is the green bar. You can see the students were able to make more design decisions and then more design decisions expressly related to the environmental sustainability of the product just by taking the quiz. Uh, we did a second study with a graduate level class where we had them design a product, take the green quiz on that product, uh, and then re, uh, redesign the product based on the results of the quiz. Uh, so the before bar is blue. We had students, and these are experts, these are grad students, making a lot of decisions about uh, material selection and one student making decisions about use uh, in their kind of their first step at the, at the product design. And then after they took the clean quiz, they were really kind of dramatically broadening the scope of different design considerations they could make that would reduce the environmental impact of the product. So this thing works pretty well. It's a good idea. Um, as far as the plot that we were showing you before, you know, we really want the green quiz to be in the upper left corner, but it's not quite there yet. Um, we showed that it's much more effective when people have already started designing something as opposed to something that's gonna help them get there. So um, we've been kind of working to improve it and I'll let you know as soon as we get the 
the feedback from yesterday's study on that. <laughs> um, one of the other things we've been looking at is this design repository. Uh, this idea that you can use design repository information to drive concept generation um, in kind of a quantitative way. So if I have a set of products, I can say, all right, all of my products that are made out of aluminum have these kind of specific sets of environmental impacts uh, and to this degree. So I know that if I make a product out of aluminum, it's going to have kind of similar set of impacts. Um, so there's, there's proven usefulness for environmental impact mitigation and concept generation using repositories like this. So our sustainable design repository, um, it, has, it has 67 products in it now, I'm pretty sure. Uh, for each one of the products, we do three different LCA methods. We do uh, Eco Indicator 99, which is the manual method, it's very easy. We do SolidWorks Sustainability because we have CAD models for all of the components of all of these products. Uh, so it ends up being, well, it's pretty extensive. Uh, and then we use a third one um, called Recipe, which is embedded in a piece of software called Gabby. Anyway, so uh, for the most complex products, we end up with 26 environmental impact metrics. Um, each one of the products has this kind of product info schema. So we make sure that each one of them has kind of the same information, the same level of detail, uses a bunch of different databases, materials databases, manufacturing process databases, use databases. Um, but our goal is to be able to use machine learning methods on the sustainable design repository. So I'm going to illustrate that here. So for a family of products, in this case, it's chairs. Uh, we want to take uh, the data that we just talked about, the data that's included in the sustainable design repository. Uh, and we want to be able to map that to product attributes using a machine learning method. So we've done this with an artificial neural network. So this idea is, if I know something about the material of something that I'm designing, can I figure out what the environmental impact is going to be? If I know something about the CAD geometry or the manufacturing process, can I back out what the environmental impact is going to be? So it's effectively trying to create like a predictive method to estimate the environmental impact as you're still designing something. Uh, one of our studies that we've done recently is on eco-labeling. I'm just going to show all of these at once. So there's three types of eco-labels. Uh, type one label is a third-party certified label, so something like the Rainforest Alliance. There's somebody else saying, yes, company A, you are absolutely doing something that is environmentally uh, better than your previous version of your product. Type two labels are self-declared, which means they're not certified. So like Greenworks, you know, they use... Uh, this kind of green imagery, there's a flower on there um, that's called green, um, but it's entirely self-declared. There isn't another label on there that says, yeah, this is actually uh, good for the environment. And then type three is when the company actually shows you the life cycle analysis. So this was a study that um, Accelerator put out. So they do like the high speed hand dryers uh, where they were analyzing the life cycle impacts, environmental impacts of using those dryers versus paper towels, things like that. So these type two labels can be especially misleading because we're really, as consumers, struck by the labels on things. Like this is evocative. I think I'm doing a good thing for the environment. I'm going to buy uh, this green work stuff. So you see things like environmental imagery or phrases, uh, this kind of perceived environmentally friend environmental friendliness. And we wanted to see if this was deceitful. Um, but generally, we did a, a, a few case studies and generally we found that the eco-label products are actually more sustainable. So we did a study with uh, water bottles, our environmentally friendly water bottle, which is the clean canteen, uh, has a 50% impact, environmental impact reduction compared to traditional plastic, like Dasani bottles. Um, saves you 100 bucks a year. Um, we also did this kind of social LCA, trying to find any sort of social impacts that might happen uh, by, by trying to reduce the environmental impact. So you're actually reducing choking hazards if you're not using disposable water bottles and little caps. Uh, we did a study on trash bags as well. Uh, again, these seventh generation trash, trash bags have an 18% environmental impact reduction. They actually cost a little bit more, um, but there's kind of this increased, oh, sorry, let's just say perception. There's this increased social perception that you are a good person if you buy uh, the more environmentally friendly trash bags. Uh, we did a study with hand dryers. The... Uh, High speed, low heat hand dryer was 115% environmental impact reduction over paper towels. Um, saves you 40 bucks a year. There's also a maintenance reduction. Um, there's a reduced burn chance and other kind of social perks 
of using uh, that particular hand dryer. Uh, and then the last study we did was on chainsaws. Uh, an electric chainsaw has a just barely imperceptible uh, higher environmental impact than a traditional chainsaw, which is surprising. Um, saves you eight bucks a year. Um, but the only social kind of benefit we could find is that you have this decreased interaction with fuel, so you're not being subjected to fumes and other things that people might find socially undesirable. Um, but this was, this was really the one instance where the eco-label was wrong. It's actually more environmentally impactful than a traditional chainsaw. Kind of interesting, right? Uh, and then the last study I'm going to talk about on the sustainability side is people use things. So how many of you drink coffee? Cool. So you in the front. Do you have a coffee maker at home? Yep. Okay. How many cups of coffee do you make in your coffee maker at home? Uh, per day. Per day, I would say one. Okay, so you wake up in the morning, you put, so you mean like 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 16 like ounces. Tomorrow, so. Yeah, okay. So you put 16 ounces of water in your coffee maker. You don't have a Keurig, do you? I have, no. Great. I have a, I have a Chemex or a Okay, or oh, okay, so you're fancy, great. Um, <laughs> but you have X amount of coffee grinds, grounds. I'm gonna be literally say grinds. Coffee grounds, uh, you got a filter of some sort, you've got water, you've got potentially electricity or some means of heating the water yep. depending on, on your coffee maker, great. The way that we do LCA right now, I would assume every single person in the world is exactly like you. Okay. A, everybody drinks coffee. I don't, but I'm gonna make that assumption. I'm also gonna assume that everybody's drinking 16 ounces of coffee in the coffee they make at home. This is a terrible assumption, right? All of you are thinking I had six cups of coffee before nine, right? Um, there's really wide variation in users. And when you have a product where you've got consumables like electricity or heat or coffee grounds, uh, the variation in how people are using things dramatically affects the environmental impact by a lot, up to 80% we found. So we did a study of products that we have in the design repository that have consumables. So people are, um, as they are using the product, it requires electricity, it requires some fuel or some other product that it eats up like a Keurig. So we, these are the, I think there's 20 products up there. So we've got some that are electricity only, things like your refrigerator, smoke alarm, uh, electric drill. Some are electricity and other things. Um, we have a tattoo gun in the sustainable design repository. One of my graduate students moonlights as a tattoo artist. So there you go. Um, but that obviously uses electricity and also ink, right? Um, we've got a 3D printer, electric toothbrush. Uh, the consumable in the electric toothbrush is not toothpaste, it's the heads. These are supposed to look like them, right? Uh, we got other. We had an oil lamp, which uses fuel, mechanical pencil. The consumable there is lead, gas lawnmower, a stapler, consumable from staplers, staples, stuff like that. So we analyzed all of these products and then tried to back out uh, what sort of environmental impacts were um, were particularly responsible to how people use those products. Kind of how bad is it that we're estimating that everybody is using these products in the same way when we do life cycle assessment? Um, so we found some interesting things. So if you've got a product that uses electricity uh, and has other consumables, and one of those consumables is plastic or metal. So this is the Keurig example, right? So your Keurig's gotta be plugged in. It uses water, it uses the K-cups. Those K-cups are plastic. If it uses a lot of plastic, then almost all of the environmental impact of the use of your Keurig is carcinogenic. Causes cancer, which is bad, right? Um, so this is one of the studies that we're kind of in the middle of right now, and we keep coming up with these results that are just um, but in the end, really, the, the important point is we, as mechanical designers, have to have a better handle on how people are using these products, or else we're going to keep making these dramatic, dramatically bad assumptions uh, about environmental impact. Okay. Devin, how much time do I got left? 10, 20. Okay, great. All right. I'm going to shift gears now. Everybody ready? All right. We're going to stop talking about product sustainability. We're going to talk about renewable energy. Um, so a lot of my work, especially coming up through my PhD, was on this cute little academic test problem called wind farm optimization. So have you ever flown over a wind farm? So I, I, I did this, I think my first year in grad school, and noticed that all of the wind turbines were in straight rows, like this. So think about this from an aerodynamics perspective. Does this make sense? Does it make sense that the wind turbines are located in straight rows like this? Maybe, 
uh, if your goal is to maybe reduce the amount of road you have maybe maintenance access roads between turbines, then it might make sense. Um, but from an aerodynamics perspective, it really doesn't. These tur The turbines that are downstream are seeing flow that's really turbulent um, caused by the or uh, by being located in the wakes of the turbines upstream. <laughs> so my work was focusing on wind farm optimization. So can I build a computational algorithm that will tell me where wind turbines are supposed to be located on the wind farm to try to benefit from these interactions, reduce costs, of power development, take into account realism in this problem. Uh, and this is actually a really big problem because wind is the, the number one growing source of electricity generation in North America. Um, and we're not optimizing these farms beforehand. We're just kind of putting them up uh, and not really making these uh, considerations up front. And it could have potentially huge cost and power ramifications down the line. So the wind farm optimization problem is this. For a particular site and for an assessment of what the wind behaves like at that site. So this is a wind rose. So that tells me the frequency uh, and wind speed of different directions of wind at this site. I need to write an algorithm that will place wind turbines at this site such that uh, the farm is developing as much power as possible and is doing so at a reasonable cost. So I'm gonna talk very quickly about what systems optimization is. The idea is if you can formally present, represent an engineering design or decision-making problem as a mathematical problem, so you can model you have models that represent the behavior. You have constraints that limit your search space to something that makes sense in the real world. You've got objectives. This is, I'm saying this is what matters to me. So what are the objectives for wind farm optimization, do you think? What matters to us? Sure, power development. Size. The size of the farm? Yeah, I think that's a constraint. We're not necessarily trying to reduce the size of the farm. We usually say, I'm going to buy nine acres, kind of thing. What other objectives matter to us? Yeah, that's really interesting. So that has more to do with the design of the turbines themselves, but absolutely. Anything else? Sure, costs in general, maintenance costs, operations and maintenance costs are a huge part of that. Um, but costs in general, we don't want these things to cost a lot, right? Um, so if you can come up with mathematical models for all of these things, then you can use theory or numerical methods to understand and solve that mathematical problem. So I'm pretty sure this is the, this is a plot depicting the objective of minimizing the amount of cardboard you use in a box. So like, if I bought something from Amazon, I want to use the smallest box possible. Um, so you can see this has a very clear minimum. There is one set optimal value here. So if I can represent it mathematically, I can write an algorithm that finds me that minimum point. And that's the, the right size of my box. Great, yay. Except most engineering problems cannot be represented this simply, right? So here's an example of, of kind of this 2D optimization. So these are, these are results from one of my earliest studies. So we've got this objective function, which is this interplay between power development and cost of a wind farm. We've got the number of turbines on the farm. You can see that there's a minimum value here. It's making this curve, right? So I can say, yep, the optimum number of turbines is 42. We're gonna put 42 turbines on this farm. Great. Most of the time, engineering optimization problems are multi-objective. We've got multiple things that matter to us, and we're not really sure which one matters more. So like the wind farm example, which one matters more? That it's inexpensive or that it develops a lot of power? We don't know. The real answer is we don't know. Um, so we do these kind of multi-objective analyses and they make what's called a Pareto front. Those red dots there, the ones that are closest to the origin, those are our ideal solutions, but there's a bunch of them, right? Um, so there's this whole, uh, this whole field of research and optimization, just trying to handle these problems and algorithms to solve those problems. Um, when you get into really complex problems, then the solution spaces start to look like this. Uh, this is a MATLAB plot. So I'm starting here. Um, I've got all of these competing objectives and constraints. I've got this discontinuity here. There's just a hole in all my solution. Uh, Fmin Khan is a built-in optimizer in MATLAB, if you ever get bored. Um, uh, the Fmin-Khan solution's up there, but the best solution is actually this minimum down here. Um, 
And the wind farm optimization problem actually looks a lot like this. It's hugely what we call multimodal, so tons of hills and valleys. Um, so even just looking at this, I can't tell you what the minimum value is on that plot. So writing an algorithm that can find it is very hard to do as well. A lot of engineering problems actually look like this mathematically. This is what they would look like if you could do mathematical representations of them. So uh, we write algorithms kind of specifically designed to solve these kind of ugly problems. So one of the reasons why we use a specific set of optimization algorithms is because complex systems are ugly. They have ugly results. So there might be an unclear local, unclear number of local or global optima, these multimodal solution spaces. They could be multi-objective. If it has more than three objectives, then we can't even visualize it, so that makes it even harder. Um, it could be too computationally expensive to do an exhaustive search. Uh, we have this inability to calculate models or objectives using derivatives due to formulations, continuity, some effects in this law. Um, sometimes this involves us making discrete continuous choices, and that, believe it or not, is really hard to model. So if I changed my wind farm optimization algorithm to not only pick the location of turbines, but to also pick and make a model of turbine from a list of available turbines, the whole thing would explode. It doesn't like making discrete choices and continuous choices at the same time. So renewable energy systems kind of very clearly fall into this category. And that means we need a special class of algorithms to solve it. Um, these are called heuristic optimization methods, meta-heuristic optimization methods, um, if you're in Europe. So I've laid out these methods on a continuum here from deterministic to stochastic. Y'all know what stochastic means? Random. It's a fancy way of saying random. So here, the deterministic algorithms, like this greedy heuristic, all this says is this algorithm is going to solve this problem the same way every time. There's no randomness in it. I will always traverse the search space. My turbines are always going to move in the same way. It's always going to test them in the same way. I'm always going to get the same result. Versus over here on the stochastic side, those algorithms have randomness in it. Maybe I'm pre-populating a bunch of wind farms where the turbines are randomly located. I'm choosing turbine sizes that are random. Um, even the way that it kind of traverses through the search might be random. So if you've ever heard of a genetic algorithm, which is an optimization algorithm that benefits from this idea of like human reproduction, you have solutions that mate and procreate, create children's solutions, and then you evaluate those solutions. It's like survival of the fittest. So like the traits of the children that get passed on over and over and over again. Um, it's like accelerated mating. Um, that's really random. There's mutation and other things involved in it. Uh, so I'm going to step you through two of these algorithms just to give you kind of a better handle on how they work. So the first one is an extended pattern search. So here's how a pattern search works. So this is just a contour plot. And the red star is indicating the, the best value. It's this minimum value of this contour plot, the deepest valley. And I want to go find that. So if my turbine starts here, the pattern search is going to walk us through a set of pattern directions. Uh, and I define these. And I, I said it's going to be plus x, plus y, minus x, minus y. Uh, and I've defined this initial step size. So my turbine agent is going to try this first move, the 1. And since it moves that closer to the goal state, it's going to take it. It's going to take that move. It's like, yes, this evaluation is better. I'm going to stay here. Uh, then I'll try the next move. So that would be move 2, which is plus y. You can see that also moves it closer to the goal. So it'll take that move as well. Uh, the third and fourth moves won't move it closer to the goal, so the turbine, the agent doesn't take it. It doesn't want to move that way. Um, the search repeats. So it'll take another step in one, another step in two, it'll skip three and four. Uh, from here, neither move one or two is actually going to move it closer to the goal. It's not going to be a better evaluation. You can see it's kind of, one is going to make it skip over it. It's going to be just as far away on the other side. Um, so what it does here is it has the step size. So it can't take a move in any direction, it has the step size, and it starts again. Uh, and then it can get pretty close to the goal. So this is a pattern search. Pattern searches are really easy. You could embed one right now for solving, I don't know, putting your groceries away. Whatever optimization problem matters to you. I care a lot about the orientation of things in my fridge. Also my dishwasher, anything like that. Uh, so pattern searches are easy, they're deterministic, they're all the way on this side of that spectrum I showed you. It's always going to traverse the space in the same way. Uh, always going to end up with the same result. Uh, we do something called extensions in this pattern search, which kind of add randomness to it, which makes it work a little bit better. So in the wind farm optimization problem, we use this randomized initial layout, we use a randomized search order, and then something called a popping algorithm. So I'll show you that algorithm. So our solution space is a little different now. Now we've got two potential solutions. We've got this local min, 
which is the gray star. And the red star up there is our global min. That's what we want to find. We want to find the best solution in the entire space. So if our turbine starts here, it's going to traverse the same way we just talked through. Uh, and then it's going to kind of get stuck here by this gray star. It's going to be traversing all of its patterns, different step sizes. It'll get really close to that gray star. And it's not even going to know that up over that ridge, there's a better solution. Right? Uh, the popping algorithm goes through and finds each one of these agents that's maybe not evaluating as good as it could be. And it tries popping them to new random locations. Keeps the new location if it makes the entire search better. Um, otherwise, it goes back to where it is. So here, now the, the turbo could uh, hone in on that better solution. All right, so the TLDR, there are literally countless opportunities to use design automation and AI to advance renewable energy systems design. Uh, as a community, we've done really great work in this area, but very little of it is actually suitable for real world application because we're not making these considerations about what actually matters to the people who own the land, the people who are gonna use the power, the wind farm developers, but as our computational capabilities continue to expand, so does our understanding of how to use them in renewable energy. So we have this unique opportunity to write exciting new algorithms and apply them uh, to new renewable energy challenges. And one of these challenges is offshore energy. So these are wave, wave tidal and offshore wind capabilities uh, for the coast of the United States. So there's 45,000, uh, wait, yeah, sorry, yeah, it's 10 times what the US used last year uh, in electricity generation potential just from these three sources just on the coast. So we're really interested in this in Oregon in particular because we have this beautiful wind resource here. Um, the wind's unobstructed coming over the Pacific. So it's a really nice, very uh, stable wind resource. We also have this great wave resource. We've ever stood in the ocean and gotten knocked back by the waves. That's exactly how wave energy converters work. They, they harvest that motion, that momentum. Uh, the Oregon coast is kind of interesting uh, in that the entire coast is microgridded. There are only seven connections, and this is a mountain range here. Um, there are seven connections to the main Oregon grid from the coast. So if any number of them go out, five is ours. We're, we're just inside the mountain range uh, from there. Uh, if any one of these connections go out, it's supposed to be out of power for days. Uh, and I don't know if you've heard, but everybody in the Pacific Northwest is gonna die in a terrible earthquake. Did you hear about this? The Cascadia subduction zone earthquake, which is evidently like 150 years overdue, or something like that. Um, so yeah, when that happens uh, and, and uh, the power grid gets knocked out, it's gonna take a really long time to get the coast back up. Uh, so this idea of using uh, coastal resources to generate electricity certainly makes a lot of sense in Oregon, but makes a lot of sense uh, in a lot of different places. The electricity supply in Oregon is, is interesting. We are, if you count hydro as renewable, which some people do and some people don't, uh, we're at 75% renewable energy in the state of Oregon already. Uh, so there's kind of a huge political capital for doing more renewable energy work like offshore energy. Um, one of the things that, that's kind of interesting about the West Coast is that we can't just use regular offshore wind turbines. So in the U.S. last year, we put in our first offshore wind farm, it's Block Island near Rhode Island, um, which is great. And they have these embedded turbines, they're called monopiles, um, where you just have this tall tower and you just stick that directly down into the seabed. The West Coast of the United States, you can't really do that um, because the West Coast, uh, the bathymetry, that's the, the seabed, drops off really quickly close to shore. The water gets very deep very quick. Um, so we have to use floating wind turbines. So take all of the problems that you know exist with onshore wind turbines, uh, all the problems we know exist with offshore wind turbines, especially politically, it's very hard to get offshore wind established in the United States. And now we're going to make them float. Right, so we're this is an engineering design problem, right? Now we're introducing all of this, this craziness uh, where we have wave flow, we have uh, wind flow, we have corrosion potential because of the salt water. Um, we can tug them around and move the location of the farm or change the position of the turbines with respect to each other. We can put them 20 miles offshore so nobody can see them. Anyway, so there's a lot of considerations to be made here. Uh, but the, the kicker behind uh, floating offshore wind is that uh, it's gonna be necessary on the West Coast. Um, offshore winds are stronger and much more consistent than onshore. They don't have to compete with skyscrapers or cows or corn. Uh, and 
like I said, they're kind of better suited for deep bathymetry. And there's an estimated 900 gigawatts of power available on the U.S. Pacific coast, which is an awful lot. I'm going to skip a couple of these. So some of the work that we've done in offshore is we developed a cost model uh, to figure out how much offshore wind farms are going to cost. Um, like we talked about when we talked about optimization, if you have a mathematical model for it, you can optimize for it. And this didn't exist yet. So we wrote that. Um, we've done a lot of work with optimizing how the positions need to, sorry, the turbines need to be positioned with respect to each other uh, to try to drive down those costs, but increase their power development. So here's some example of floating offshore wind farms. This is an aerial view. Um, you can see that they're just trying to get out of each other's wakes. Those dotted lines are representations of the wakes. Uh, we've done some work in hybrid wind wave systems. So the idea is if you have a wave energy converter, it's harvesting momentum from the waves and you've got those like in an arc or a field in front of an offshore wind farm then it's going to reduce the wave height getting into the offshore wind farm uh, and then the offshore wind farm is going to be more resilient it's not going to fail as easily uh, and then my senior phd student who's about to defend in a couple of weeks this is his work where he's trying to optimize where wave energy converters can be placed uh, in an array this is the same exact problem as optimizing wind farms, except wind turbines, you're trying to get them as far away from each other as they can while kind of minimizing the amount of space that they use, right? Because their interactions are always negative. You put a wind turbine in another one's wake, seeing turbulent flow, it's this corkscrew and corkscrew, it's a mess. With wave energy converters, they actually benefit from being close together. Um, they develop more power when they're grouped together than they do when they're in isolation. It's kind of cool. Well, think about it, they bob up and down, so they make a wake. So if you put another one in that wake, it's going to see a higher wave height and be able to develop more power. Um, I'm going to skip through these. Uh, so this is a recent study that we did where we optimized the position of wave energy converters. We actually built five of these small wave energy converters, and we have a large wave tank at Oregon State um, where we're testing them this week. We have them oriented in a bunch of the array designs that we made computationally, trying to make sure that our models uh, match up those. This is kind of fun. This is a, a $26 wave energy converter. It's made out of a barrel. Um, it's a little more than $26, but barrel is $26. So uh, that's kind of fun. Um, one of the things that we found out is that uh, not only if you have the wave energy converters located in just kind of this, these sweet spots, this kind of close packed, uh, uh, you know, they have to be a certain distance apart. There's kind of a, a method to the madness, but they develop a lot more power than they would in isolation. That's this interaction factor being greater than one. Um, but it's also for certain wave heights and certain wave periods, like the lengths of the waves, it can develop up to 80% more power than it would if they were in isolation, which is pretty cool. All right, so I'm gonna wrap up because I think I'm way over time. So as far as what's next for us, um, we're really interested in multi-scale offshore energy systems design. So a lot of the solutions that we've been talking about are grid scale. We wanna put lots of really big wind turbines. We want to put lots of really big wave energy converters. Um, but there are coastal towns that are completely run on diesel generators right now. Uh, so we're trying to work on smaller scale solutions that might be helpful to more people. Um, we're expanding our sustainable design repository. We're doing a lot of uh, product use studies. We're about to launch a survey to try to gauge how actual people use products. I'll make sure to send it to Dr. Berg, send it to y'all and tell me how you use your products especially your coffee machines, since that seems to be a point of contention. Um, we're doing a lot of work in reliability. RBDO is reliability-based design optimization, uh, trying to design in reliability to these offshore systems before we actually uh, go do them. Uh, and then I am a big proponent of open science. So one of the things that we've been working on in my lab is making all of our data, all of our code, all of our publications publicly available and as transparent as possible. Uh, this is beneficial for dang near everybody, but specifically for researchers, it helps with reproducibility, making sure that people aren't, uh, you know, posting false results, helping with analysis, uh, things like that. But when I was in graduate school, I, I really struggled with finding papers. So I'm determined to not be that researcher. All of our stuff's publicly available. So you can pull any of it and use it and tell us what you think. So thank you very much. Uh, sorry that went a little bit long, but I'd be happy to take any questions or chat with any of you at any point. Thank our speaker, thank you.